please welcome to the stage Mike Vecchio. I'm sorry I look like every cop that's been in trouble on the news. <laughs> it's a weird time, you know? During the height of the pandemic, my friend calls me up. He goes, Mike, do you want to go to Spain this year for running with the bulls? I go, isn't that a bit soon? Remember last week when the air almost killed us? <laughs> Remember five days ago, we were almost murdered by the air? And now you want to go running with the bulls which I know that's what it's called, but that's not actually what you're gonna be doing. <laughs> Running with the bulls implies that the bulls have accepted you <laughs> and you guys have decided to exercise together. <laughs> what you're gonna be doing is running from the bulls. <laughs> Do you understand the difference? Running with, running from. Everybody's so focused on pronouns now, maybe we should take a look at some of these prepositions. <laughs> running with. Running from. <laughs> He's kind of an unhealthy guy, so I took a shot at him. I go, instead of running with the bulls, why don't you just try running? Because <laughs> you know what can kill you besides bulls? A sedentary lifestyle. <laughs> he goes, well, let me know. You know, we all have to get COVID tests before we go over. I go, oh, do they want us completely healthy for when we're murdered by bulls? <laughs> my girlfriend moved in with me during the pandemic, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself first. I'm 100% Italian. Thank you. <laughs> and I tell people that, and I get pushback. They go, 100% your mother and father? I go, that's what 100% means. <laughs> what, did you drop out of the fifth grade? They go, can you speak it? I go, no, I'm third generation. They go, oh, you're not real. But I tried, I took an Italian language class at my high school, but I was failing it. So I did the most Italian thing I could think of. I went to the teacher after class and I said, look, I'm getting an F, I'm failing your class. But what do you say you give me a B and nothing will happen to you or your family? There's nothing more Italian than that. Now, my girl is from rural Indiana, and uh, I learned this very early on during the quarantine. People from rural Indiana do not like to be called hillbillies. <laughs> Did you guys know that? <laughs> That's considered a slur. The correct term is caged free. <laughs> the caged free do not like to be called hill folk. It gets their overalls in a twist. The hardest thing about moving in with someone is getting adjusted to each other's bad habits. I'll go first with mine. My bad habit is yelling. I do yelling. And I thought, oh, this is just being Italian-American, but that's not what it's called now. That's not what it's called in 2022. It's not called being Italian-American. Now it's called toxic and problematic. It's no longer ethnic. It's now toxic and problematic. Her problem, and since she's not here, we'll get into it. She leaves her crap all over the place. I mean, real bad. Cupboards open, drawers open, clothes all over the floor. So I go, were you raised in a barn? That's a pretty standard thing to say to somebody who's being a slob, were you raised in a barn? But she's from rural Indiana. So it turns out she actually was raised in a barn. She took it personal and it started a four day fight. But it was a cultural miscommunication and she did it back to me. During the fight, she called me a pig and that's a slap in the face in my culture. But to somebody from rural Indiana, a pig is your friend. She just meant that you are very loyal and trustworthy. But I remember the first time our bad habits collided. You know, I walk in the apartment and it's a mess and I go, what is this? What is this? And she comes out of the room and looks at me and goes, please stop yelling. I go, oh, I wasn't yelling at you. I was yelling at the person that I thought kidnapped you. 
because this looks like a crime scene. What are you trying to tell me with this? You're from the Midwest, are you pro-tornado? Because I'm anti-tornado. I think they destroy lives. But it's not that, it's just that Indiana is a different place than New York. It's not better or worse, it's just different. I went to go visit her people, very nice. I ducked away for a little alone time, I went to the diner. I had a great meal and I got the bill and the bill was for $6. So I call the waitress over, I go, excuse me, miss, there must be some mistake. This says $6. She goes, there's no mistake, and you're gonna pay every penny of it. I go, I don't think you understand. What I'm saying is, I have enough money in my pocket right now to buy this restaurant. So living together is going pretty good for me, guys, but uh, I made a mistake uh, during the quarantine and uh, don't ever do this with your significant partner. We're laying in bed and I go, let's get to know each other a little bit better. On the count of three, let's blurt out our IQs. <laughs> Never do that with your significant partner. One of you is dumber. <laughs> and in my case, it was me and I was much dumber. And she loves me, so she was trying to save it. She goes, Mike, you have a much lower IQ than I do. Even you're smart enough to know that. <laughs> she goes, but you have this other thing called emotional intelligence, and that's pretty valuable too. <laughs> and I did some research, and it turns out emotional intelligence is completely made up. <laughs> it's fake. It's just something that smart people tell dumb people that they have so that the dumb people don't kill themselves. And they stay alive, and they do the jobs that the smarter people don't want to do. So my jobs in the apartment are as follows. Sanitation and extermination. Bugs and trash. That's what I do, I do bugs and trash. And sometimes she'll quiz me. She'll go, what are your jobs? I'll go, bugs and trash. And she'll be like, who's my guy? I go, I am. Nail it. Nail it every time. We recently had an incident. There was a bug in the bathroom. And the reason I know, because she was in the bathroom and she yells, a bug, a bug, it's a bug, there's a bug. I'm like, all right, car alarm, I got it. I go in, flick the light on, bug freezes, I freeze, it's a standoff. Now I try to kill this bug three times. Third time I step directly on him, scoop him up with toilet paper. He's still alive but wounded. So I throw him in the toilet. I flush the toilet. Is swirling around. This bug pushes away from the toilet paper. He Heisman's the toilet paper, swims to the side of the bowl, starts climbing out. I see that, I back out of the bathroom. I go, it's all good, babe. She goes in the bathroom, she comes back out, she goes, he's alive and better than ever. I go, let me tell you something about this bug. He has more of a will to live than you and me combined. She goes, well, go back in there and kill him. I go, relax, this isn't a mafia family, okay? This bug has a lot of the characteristics, actually, that I admire in any living thing. This bug is resilient, overcomes adversity, mentally tough, never quits. This bug is basically who I wanna be as a person. I'm not gonna go back in there and kill my role model. He just lives with us now. She goes, well, I'm afraid to go in the bathroom. I go, well, you should be. Cause you ordered his death three times. And I'm sure he overheard you. Cause this bug probably doesn't have the highest IQ. 
but I'm sure he's got a lot of emotional intelligence. Thank you. Thank you. I've had to move a few times in New York, though. One time because of bed bugs. Have you guys had them? Bed bugs are aggressive. They just attack you and attack you until you break your lease. There's no way to stop bed bugs. I think that's my message here tonight. I did figure out a way to slow them down, though. I introduced ladybugs into my apartment. Now, the ladybugs don't kill the bed bugs, but they wear them down emotionally. That joke does good with about half the crowd. The other half doesn't like it so much. I put that joke on Twitter. I got attacked worse than I got attacked by bed bugs. But I'm just moving in now, and you guys are looking at me like, Mike, you're a sweet piece. How are you not married? And the answer is because I went through a lot of breakups. When I break up with a woman now, never pleasant, I like to do it at a restaurant because I feel like it's a public place and she will not cause a scene. Can I share a secret with you guys? The women of today will yell at you right in a restaurant. So you know what I do now? I take her to a Chinese restaurant. That way if she yells at me, it just seems like she's working at the restaurant. I'm sorry, is that joke too sweet and sour for some of you guys? I didn't mean to ruin your happy family, which is another delicious entree. I just think it's really bad dating from your phone because there's no compromise. If you don't like someone, you just swipe them away, you know, and you get rid of them. Back in the day, we used to have to compromise. I went on a phone date before I met my girl. First thing the woman said to me, I'm a vegan, I'm a vegan. Is that the first thing we should be saying to each other? How about your name? What's your favorite color? I'm a vegan, I'm a vegan. So I go, look, I'm on the keto diet. All I eat is meat. We're on opposite ends of the dietary spectrum, but there's a chance to what? Compromise, we did not go down that road. Cause then she goes, I wouldn't even eat food that has touched me. And then I go, I only eat emotional support animals. You wanna keep playing this game? We can keep playing this game. Now when you move in with your significant partner, which is what Twitter makes me call my girlfriend now. That's funnier than what you guys gave it. When you move in with your significant partner, you have to talk about what you value in an apartment. And she went first. She goes, we really need a doorman. And I go, why? She goes, for protection, in case someone is trying to get us. I go, what are you into? I've been living a pretty Judeo-Christian life without many enemies on the streets. I don't know what you're into, where you need protection. She goes, we just need a man to protect us. I go, well, I'm a man who could technically protect us. She goes, yeah, but you're not a doorman. And it occurred to me, she doesn't know what a doorman does because she's from rural Indiana. It's the closest thing they have to a doorman in rural Indiana is a scarecrow, <laughs> which is like the doorman of the crops. I go, you understand, this is a doorman. His functions are as follows. He opens and closes the door, and sometimes he takes packages. But he's not a Navy SEAL or a ninja. He's a doorman. I'm vaccinated, and I'm telling you that because I want you to know I'm a hero. I got the one that gives you blood clots. I got the blood clot one. 
I got the one that gives you blood clots. I used to say Johnson and Johnson, but before I would get to the second Johnson, whoever I was talking to would go, blood clots. You have the blood clot one. You have the one that gives you blood clots. So now I just save everybody time and I go, blood clots. I have the blood clot one. I have the one that gives you blood clots. But it's gonna work to my advantage because New York City where I live is getting increasingly violent. And I figure if I get shot in the street, I won't bleed out. <laughs> He'll be like, you know what saved this guy? Blood clots. He had the blood clot one. He had the one that gives you blood clots. I am gonna miss some things about the pandemic though. For example, having my temperature taken like I'm being executed. <laughs> Remember that at the restaurants? You wanna see our menu? You wanna see our menu, don't you, huh? You wanna look at our specials? It's aggressive, you know? I didn't feel safe. I started carrying my own thermometer around with me for protection. That's my second amendment. That's my second amendment. I got the right, I got the right. So they'd be like, you wanna see our menu? I'd be like, what's up now, dog? How you doing? How you doing? No, you need to give me your email. No, I'll take your email in case I have to track you like a little baby wolf. But I say the pandemic has been different for everybody. It's been harder on all of us in here, I would say, just looking at you guys. That's not a slam, guys. It's harder on all of us because we all had to wear masks. And I wore a mask, you know, whatever was required. But harder on all of us, I would say, because we're all good looking. And when you wear a mask and you're good looking, people can't tell that you're good looking. And it's terrible. As attractives, we're used to being treated a certain way all of our lives. But because we had to wear these masks, people couldn't tell that we were attractive. And it was terrible. Example, height of the pandemic, I'm in Starbucks, mask up for safety reasons. Woman behind the counter starts talking to me sideways. I had to stop her, I go, excuse me, miss? I'm handsome. You can't talk to me that way. You can't talk to me that way. You're talking to me like I'm an ugly, and I'm not an ugly. Actually, miss, I'm an attractive. You want me to prove it? I'll take my mask off and kill everybody in here with my tiny vapors. Is that what you want? You want me to kill everybody with my tiny vapors? I'm an attractive. Because I'm just talking to you guys right now, you know? Other attractives. No disrespect to the people out there. but the uglies have had a good run. They really have, walking around, masks up, pretending to be us. And now that this thing is winding down, they're looking for any excuse to keep their masks on. I hear them talking, it could be a variant, it could be a variant. I'm like. Cut the crap. It's not a variant. You had a good run. <laughs> Stop trying to be us. You know? Get a skill, you know? That's the way you gotta talk to them sometimes. You gotta go get a skill. But there's extremes on both sides of this, you know? Height of the pandemic, uh, outside of my building in New York, there's uh, a woman. She had two masks and a face shield on outside. And that's fine, you know, whatever, but where is this going, you know? You throw wipers and a turn signal on her, she's a car. Maybe that's where this goes. Maybe we evolve into tiny cars. Then I got a friend in Florida who doesn't believe any of this is real. He just makes up his own facts. He goes, it's all fake, Mike. It's all fake, you know? He goes, what are the deaths, one in 400? He goes, Mike, do you know one in five Floridians gets decapitated by their own ceiling fan? I go, what? 
He goes, that's real talk, Mike. The mainstream media isn't gonna talk about that. One in five Floridians decapitated by their own ceiling fans. It's Game of Thrones down here, Mike. We're getting murdered by our own appliances. And then he goes, Dr. Fauci is a chiropractor. He always takes a shot at Fauci on the way out. Dr. Fauci don't make his own spaghetti sauce, Mike. What kind of Italian don't make his own gravy, Mike? What else is he not telling us? Thank you. I probably should have used barbecue sauce for you guys here because it's more applicable. I'll be happy to never take another COVID test again because the healthcare professionals, while heroes, can be quite aggressive. <laughs> Bedside manner went out the window about halfway through this thing. Last time I went in for a COVID test, the woman said exactly nothing to me. <laughs> went and got a swab. I think it was a swab, could have been a screwdriver. <laughs> if I'm being honest, it felt like a Phillips head. And she must have played college softball because she came from back here. And just boom, dry dock me hit my frontal lobe. I lost my sense of direction for like a week. <laughs> Afterwards, I looked at her. I'm like, is this even about COVID? <laughs> you just seem angry. And it feels like you're using COVID to get a lot of your frustrations out. <laughs> COVID-19, let's do a deep dive, guys. What do we know about COVID-19? Well, we know it came from China, so we know it works. Italy got hit hard, but I think it's because Italy was trying to treat it with recipes. <laughs> nice try, Italy, but not helpful. <laughs> who do I blame? Is that what you guys want to know? The people who wanted to get rid of straws. <laughs> Remember those heroes? We got to get rid of the straws. We got to get rid of the straws because the straws are killing the turtles. So fine, we got rid of the straws. But then we started putting our mouths on everything. We started raw dogging everything with our mouths. And then we all got the coronavirus. And then we started dying. And did the turtles help us? No, they didn't, guys. They were conveniently quarantining in their shells. Probably mumbling slurs about us, you know? Turtles are really old. Do you guys need more time with these jokes or are you gonna get them? My new fear, now that COVID has subsided, is being pushed onto the subway tracks. I don't know if you guys get our news here in Nashville, you know, the Nashville Tribune or the Nashville Inquisitor. I'm not sure what your paper is called, but we're pushing each other on the subway tracks. And the big problem is you don't know who's gonna push you. If it was one person, we could strategize around that individual, but it could be anybody. And I'll tell you what the answer isn't, asking each person on the platform if they're thinking about pushing. Because <laughs> I saw a guy who looked suspicious and I said, sir, you don't look right. Are you thinking about pushing? He goes, I wasn't before you mentioned it. But to be honest, now that you brought it up, it sounds like it might be refreshing. Yeah, guys, it's pushing season. So I just assumed I'm getting pushed, you know. Every time I'm on the platform, I get in a stance. Knee slightly bent, head on a swivel. You know, good form, getting ready to get pushed. Because I feel like if I get pushed, a lot of the trains are delayed, I can pop back up. Now I'm in that guy's head, you know? <laughs> so no one talks about the pop-up. You're ready to get pushed and you get pushed and you pop back up. It shows that guy I'm resilient, right? <laughs> He's just gonna push me in front of a train, dog. <laughs> Am I relating to some of the younger people that way? <laughs> Maybe, it, should I say dog at the end of the jokes? It's just, I'm trying to. I'm trying to relate to the Gen Z's. 
So I'm on the platform, knees slightly bent, head on a swivel, ready to get pushed. I see a guy now, he's a waiter at one of the clubs I work. I go, hey man, what's up? How was your pandemic? He goes, pretty good. I go, are you going back to work soon? He goes, I don't do that anymore. I sell Bitcoin now. <laughs> he goes, do you know what Bitcoin is? I go, I don't think anyone actually knows what Bitcoin is. <laughs> he goes, well, let me explain it to you. And about five minutes into the explanation, I was like, I'd rather you just push me onto the tracks. <laughs> So now I'm taking Lyft, and uh, I know you guys probably don't take Lyft, you know, because you guys have cars. I'm sorry, I'm sorry trucks. I'm sorry. I don't like Lyft, you know. I like to put in where I'm going. I want Lyft to give me the price and how long it's going to take to pick me up. And Lyft initially does that, but then they start negotiating, and I don't like that. They're like, hey, Mike, instead of picking you up in four minutes... How about we knock a dollar 75 off and we pick you up in 22 minutes? Would that be cool? No, Lyft, that would not be cool. I'm in a dangerous neighborhood. I might not be alive in 22 minutes. Well, how about we knock $4 off and we send you a car with a driver who may or may not be drunk? You might have to actually drive. How about we knock $8 off and we just send you a guy, no car? I go, is this even Lyft anymore? This feels like Grindr. This feels like a gay hookup app. And I am not gay. But I do love a discount. So. I guess it's decision time for me. And how much feedback does Lyft need? I'm flying out of LaGuardia, which is one of our airports in New York. I fly out like at 6 a.m. I get to the airport, my phone's blowing up. I'm like, who's calling me this early? Who's texting me? It's Lyft with a bunch of questions. How was the ride? Rate the driver, review the ride, give him a tip, give him a compliment. I'm like, oh my God. I wanted a ride to the airport. I didn't want to become a foster parent. How much work is this? So I just did it old school, verbally. I go, Farik. his name was Farik. I say to him, I go, Farik, four out of five stars. He got me to the airport beautifully, but you were yelling at your wife in Farsi the entire trip. And I feel obligated to tell you that yelling is toxic and problematic. It's no longer ethnic. It is now toxic and problematic. Have you guys been flying during the Pandesi? The Pandes? The Pandas. But all my flights have been delayed because they're cleaning and sanitizing the plane. That's what they say. We're cleaning and sanitizing every part of the plane. And it's like, can you get there 15 minutes early to clean and sanitize? They go, no, we're cleaning and sanitizing. That's the reason for our delays. Nobody overslept. We're cleaning and sanitizing every part of the plane. So I get on the plane and I head to the emergency row. That's where I sit, I'm a hero. And there's crumbs in my seat. So I go to the flight attendant, I go, did you clean and sanitize the plane? She goes, we cleaned and sanitized every part of the plane. I go, what'd you clean it with, cookies? <laughs> and then I was gonna ask for seat reassignment. If you're not comfortable in the emergency row, you guys know that you can do that. You can ask for a seat reassignment. But have you ever asked for seat reassignment? They get real mad. You get more support asking for gender reassignment than you do for seat reassignment. I don't want you to think that I don't follow the rules. I do follow the rules. My problem is when someone is trying to exert power over me. I don't like that. If it's just the rules, I'll follow them. But when someone's trying to exert power, I buck. Example, I'm flying out of John F. Kennedy Airport. It's one of the airports we have in New York.
So I'm, uh, I'm taking my little bag, you know. I never check luggage. I have five outfits like this. <laughs> so I take my little bag. Before I even get close to the woman, she goes, you're gonna have to check it. You're gonna have to check that. You will have to check it. And I go, but it's my emotional support bag. I have things in there that I need for emotional support. I watch you guys let people take dogs and pigs and chickens onto the plane. I would like to take my emotional support bag on. She goes, sir, that's not real. I go, apparently, miss, you don't know that much about mental health. Because it's very real. Now, I have a letter from my doctor. And I gave her the letter and she read it and she goes, this letter is fake. And I go, I know, I'm a liar. That's part of my disability. I need my emotional support bag. I have things in there for emotional support. She goes, there's a metal contraption next to the door. If you can fit your bag in that metal contraption, you could take it on the flight. So I try, guys, like 20 times. And it's not fitting. Yet I know that it will fit in the overhead compartment. This is set up. <laughs> so I have to take my bag back to her, defeated. And she goes, I'm very sorry, but like I said, you're gonna have to check your bag. I go, I don't think you are very sorry. I think you're quietly celebrating. And then there was a joke, you know, there was a joke to be made, so I made a, I made a joke. I go, uh, I know this is John F. Kennedy Airport, but you're treating me like Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> you know, give her a little shot, give her a little shot, a little shot. She goes, be that as it may, sir. You will have to check your bag. I go, it's not even my bag. A stranger asked me to bring it onto the flight. And I'm trying to do somebody a solid. And this is what kindness gets at John F. Kennedy Airport? She goes, sir, what's so important that you have to take your bag on? What's in the bag? I go, I could tell you, but you're not gonna understand. She goes, try me. I go, inside the bag, is Bitcoin. And she goes, what's Bitcoin? I go, well, let me explain it to you. And about five minutes into the explanation, she was like, just get on the plane. Take your stupid bag on the plane. Thank you. Nice. Well, a lot of you have been thinking it, so I'll just say it. Um, yes, I have been going to the gym. And, uh, I got a very expensive gym membership. It's the most I've ever paid for a gym membership, but you have to invest in yourself. I think someone tweeted that. And um, so I go into the gym to check it out, and the woman's showing me around. She goes, first floor's all weights. Second floor is cardio equipment. Third floor is yoga studios and a steam room. And then she told me the price. And I go, which floor do you go to to declare bankruptcy? Because I'm probably gonna have to do that at some point. And like a good salesperson, she pivoted. She goes, what's your fitness goal? I go, for this much money? It's Thor. I would like to be half man, half God. I would like to have a hammer that I also use as a weapon. So I do a one day trial and I'm in the steam room trying to sweat out some of my poverty. <laughs> and I start talking to a guy in the steam room. We're having a great conversation. And at the end of the conversation, he goes, I'm gay. And I go, that's cool, man. I am a straight. <laughs> then he goes, I can flip you. And then I go, I think we have different fitness goals. <laughs> Mine is to be Thor. I'm looking to be Thor. 
that you guys are really putting me in a good mood. I got some bad news today. I found out my favorite Italian restaurant is closing, Chuck E. Cheese. And um, <laughs> guys, Charles Edward Cheese has decided to close these stores. I like the Chuck E. Cheese business model. They opened up, they're like, look, we have rats. Now, we could call an exterminator, but that's gonna cost a lot. What do you say we just lean into this thing? Let's get a rat, let's make him our spokesperson. Get him on stage, get him in a band, get him cranking out some hits. Charles Edward Cheese. That's his Christian name, Charles Edward Cheese. Somebody actually wrote me an email that said, um, it's Charles Entertainment Cheese. That's what the E stands for. I'm just letting you know. I'm like, wow, you have a lot of time on your hands, man. You're correcting for the love of Charles Edward Cheese. It's funny when you argue with somebody, I'm like, no, it's Edward. Edward is this crazy. He's like, no, it's Charles Entertainment. Look it up. And I go, I did. And it's Edward. Just keep, just saying. I had a roommate for years and years, and I loved him, but uh, he's on drugs. And um, we're hanging out one night, and he goes, do you like the Grateful Dead? I go, no. He goes, uh, well, have you ever seen them live? I go, why would I see them live if I don't like any of their songs? He's like, you gotta see them live, dude. You gotta see them live. I'm like, why? Because you get trashed and you go see them live? I would rather drop acid and go to Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> Have you ever seen that band live? <laughs> you haven't lived till you see a rat rip a guitar solo, okay? <laughs> I'm talking Charles Edward Cheese. <laughs> I'm Italian American and I live in New York and one of my passions, stand-up comedy is my job, but one of my passions before the dark times was to go from city to city around this great country and tell people in these different cities that they have terrible pizza. <laughs> it's awesome, guys. And it weirdly hurts people's feelings. And I can work it into any conversation. I was in Baltimore, I'm coming down in an elevator, I'm talking to this woman, she goes, oh, you live in New York City? How did you enjoy our aquarium? I'm like, lady, I don't know anything about your aquarium, but your pizza is terrible. She goes, what's wrong with it? And that gives you a pathway to insult their entire town. I'm like, first of all, miss, in order to have good pizza, you need good water. You guys don't have it. And maybe you're using all of your good water in your aquarium, but you're not using it in your pizza, because it sucks. Your toppings are bad. Do you have any Italians in this town who could make a pizza? Anyone who could read a recipe? Do you have anyone in this town who could read? Do you guys have schools? It's a new thing sweeping the country called schools. <laughs> then I'll compare the town negatively to another town close by. I'll go, look, I was just in Cleveland. That's not great pizza, but it's not this dog crap. <laughs> it's pretty fun, guys. You guys are a great crowd because you're getting my jokes, you know? <laughs> a lot of people don't get my jokes. Not a lot, some, you know? Some crowds don't get it. And if there's a joke in everyday life, I'll make it. <laughs> you know who does not appreciate my unique sense of humor? Chinese customs. Because I went to China before the dark times. And they were like, why are you coming to China? And I was like, to feel tall? No, I ended up in a work camp for quite some time. I dropped my phone in the toilet in China, and that's actually the best place to drop your phone in the toilet, you know, because of all the rice. <laughs> but I wouldn't put it in white rice, I put it in brown rice because of my commitment to diversity. Diversity, guys, that's the name of the game in show business now. My manager calls me up. He's like, Mike, is there anything in your background that could give us some much needed diversity? 
I go, well, I'm 100% Italian. Does that help? He goes, actually, that hurts us a lot. So if you could not mention that again, that would be a big help. Then he's like, what about what's going on inside of you? Is there any diversity there? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, with your feelings. Like, sometimes do you feel like a woman that is trapped inside of a man's body? Because that's a story we could tell. I'm like, no, that's not really happening. But I was born C-section. So I was a man who was trapped inside of a woman's body. I don't know if that counts. I don't know if that makes, am I a hero? Am I a hero? Anyway, I got my phone working in China again. And my Chinese tour guide was like, Mike, how are you enjoying China? I'm like, it's pretty good, but your pizza is terrible. And I was like, you know who has a pretty good slice? Korea. It's not great, but it's not this dog crap. Fine, guys, what's my immigration policy? Is that what you want to know? 90 day fiance. I say, if you want to come to this country, that's fine, but you have to marry one of our worst people. Have you seen that show? I would rather go back to El Salvador and fight MS-13 than to marry Darcy from Connecticut. I'm pro-immigrant, I came from immigrants, you know? But I notice in New York, the, the immigrants from the small countries, Eastern Bloc, Central America, they, uh, they yell into their phones. They're always yelling. Yelling is toxic and problematic. I don't know if you guys know that or not. It's no longer ethnic. But they're yelling into their phones and I can't help but think, that's probably why you were asked to leave your country country is so small and you're yelling, the cops were probably like, you need to go to a bigger land, more suited to your voice inflection. But I think we're good people in this country. I think it's uh, a lot of good people, you know? It's, um, I think the problem, the big divide in this country is that we're all looking at the same thing from different perspectives. It's perspective. For example, I'm a huge boxing fan. I love all kinds of boxing. And uh, I was watching this one fight. It was a female fighter, and her brother was the promoter. And they were interviewing her, and they're like, how did you start fighting? And it's a tragic story. She goes, um, when I was young, I watched my father hit my mother. I was too weak to do anything about it, so I learned to fight, and it never happened again. I'm like, wow, that's pretty powerful. Then I thought, but the brother, the promoter grew up in the same home. So he must have saw the same thing and thought to himself, I can sell tickets to this. Perspective, perspective. Now I'd like to talk about race. I'm a straight white, and uh, I'm coming out of the closet straight white. I don't know if we have a closet. We have more of a wine cellar. But sometimes, admittedly, I only see things from my straight white perspective. For example, I went to Aruba before the dark times without my significant partner, which is what Twitter makes me call my girlfriend now. And I needed somebody to rub sunblock on me and I know what you're thinking, that's a straight white problem. <laughs> but if you're a straight white, without your intimate partner, who do you ask? Another straight white? The answer is no, because we don't help each other. Do you ask the straight white's wife? Now you gotta fight the straight white. We're a jealous group. Can't ask a kid. 
I think Epstein ruined that for all of us. I asked my friend who's an African-American woman, I'm like, will you please rub sunblock on me? She goes, sunblock, Michael, is racist. I go, how so? She goes, it's a product, Michael, that's dedicated to keeping you white. I couldn't wrap my straight white brown. I couldn't. I couldn't wrap my straight white brain around it. And then she goes, and, and you could tell the level of racism by the SPF. SPF 5 is a little bit racist. SPF 40 is Nazi strength. She goes, give me one reason I should rub this sunblock on you, Michael, one reason. I go, melanoma? That was her name, Melanoma Jenkins. But I am against discrimination in all of its forms, okay? I was on the beach uh, in Aruba, same joke. And um, there's these children building a sandcastle, so I examined it very carefully, because I'm a thoughtful person. And then I kicked it over <laughs> with tears in their eyes. They were like, sir, why? And I was like, because you do not have any wheelchair accessible entrances. <laughs> this is a castle of discrimination, you little pieces of trash. And I told that joke to an audience full of people in wheelchairs, and they actually gave it a standing ovation. So you guys have a, you guys have a lot of work to do. But to be honest, guys, um, with what's going on today, I just kind of, um, I kind of do whatever fits my own narrative. Like I have a white friend who goes, uh, standardized testing is racist. And I actually agree with that because I do not do well on my SATs. <laughs> so I go, yeah, I agree. He goes, it doesn't apply to you, Mike, because you're a straight white. I go, it does apply to me. If the test is racist and I'm not a racist, I'm not gonna do well on it. <laughs> I go, what did you get on the SATs? He goes, 1580, I missed one question. I go, good job, Hitler. Now I'd like to talk about God. <laughs> I am Catholic. Anybody? Yeah. Well, for the rest of you guys who are going to hell. <laughs> when you're Catholic, what you do is you go to church, you light a candle, and you say a prayer. But I'm a very competitive Catholic, so before I light my candle, I blow everybody else's candle out. <laughs> So I don't want God getting confused between the nonsense prayers and the ones that are very important. I think even if you're an atheist, you have to admire Jesus as a historical figure. You know, I think he was great and I don't think he deserved his death, you know? All he did was, um, you know, cure leprosy, um, wash people's feet and just like multiply loaves of bread and turn water into wine. I mean, the guy was a walking after party, basically. <laughs> and he did not deserve his death, you know? And you know who else didn't deserve their deaths? Um, the guys who were crucified next to Jesus. They were criminals. They were horse thieves. I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you guys that stealing a horse is the right thing to do. <laughs> it's not. But it's not crucifixion wrong. Even for Roman times, that's a bit harsh. That's why in the Bible, there's so many letters to the Romans. People were writing in, dear Romans, how about you stop crucifying people for class three misdemeanors? You ever hear of community service Romans or house arrest? Now the story goes, there's a bitter horse thief and a contrite horse thief, and we're all supposed to be like the contrite horse thief and ask for forgiveness. But I actually understand the bitter horse thief. 
The bitter horse thief had a lot to be bitter about because he's being crucified with Jesus, who has a huge following, even at that time, you know? So Jesus got all the headlines, and Jesus got all the merch. Let's face it. I've never been wearing a cross and had someone come up to me and go, which guy was that? Was that the horse thief? Now, miss, have you been to Israel? Not yet. Well, I went over there before the dark times. Did I learn Hebrew? No, I didn't. But I looked at it a lot. And the language of Hebrew just looks like somebody is repeatedly trying to draw a footstool over and over again. It just looked like footstool, half a footstool, one leg of a footstool, footstool flipped over, footstool flipped over, footstool, one leg of a footstool, flipped over footstool, half a footstool, one leg of a footstool, 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 half a footstool. I just wish you guys a happy Easter in uh, Hebrew. I just wish you guys a happy Easter. I think Jesus had a bad lawyer. Because it was after his trial, you know, and he's waiting for the verdict, and his lawyer comes back and goes, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Which would you like first? And Jesus goes, I'm about the good news, so give me the good news. And the lawyer goes, they've decided on crucifixion. And Jesus goes, that's the good news? What's the bad news? The lawyer goes, the bad news is the Romans have a union, and the union has a contract with the state to perform the crucifixion. But they do not have a contract with the state to carry the cross to the crucifixion site. <laughs> Jesus goes, why are you telling me this? The lawyer goes, they want to pay you a non-union wage to carry the cross, you know? Jesus goes to the lawyer, he goes, uh, who are these people that are doing this to me? And the lawyer goes, they're the Romans, but later they will become Italians. And if it matters in the future, they're gonna be way into you. They're really super into your birthday. And they're gonna put nativity scenes with your whole family on their front lawn. And if anybody messes with them, they'll flip out and it'll make the newspaper. And Jesus goes, Italians, huh? Well, how about this? Everybody in their ethnicity, all the men in their ethnicity have hair on their back for the rest of eternity. All their women have mustaches. All their kids live with their parents until they're 40. And when they do move out, they move next door. How's that? Is that fun? <laughs> Tell them it's from the King of the Jews. Thank you. You guys were so amazing for me. Thank you so much for coming out with such great energy. What can I say? I love you. I love Nashville. Good night, guys. Thank you. Thank you.